Hello, uh, my name is Rob Holman. I am the development director with the Humboldt Bay Harbor District. <clears throat> this video is a recording of a presentation that was shared last night, July 23rd, 2024, with about 200 people at a public meeting at the Sequoia Conference Center in Eureka. The content of this video is effectively identical to the content that was shared last night. However, last night, the presentation was followed by around 45 minutes of question and answers from the audience, which was then followed by open public comment from dozens of community members. Anyone watching this video is bound to also have questions and thoughts, so we encourage you to attend future public meetings, come to a monthly Harbor District board meeting, or get involved in this project in other ways. The website northcoastoffshorewind.org is also a great source of reliable information. And there's another video on this YouTube channel, uh, Harbor District YouTube channel, that can provide information as well. With that, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. So, um, this presentation is about California's first offshore wind port, um, which will be in Humboldt Bay. And we are really focusing in this presentation on some preliminary visual simulations of what the project will look like in Humboldt Bay. Uh, this is being recorded on July 24th, and as I said, is identical to content shared on July 23rd um, last uh, night. So a little bit of background context on the Harbor District and our role in all of this. Uh, here's Humboldt County, the northern half of the county anyway. You can see Humboldt Bay here. The Humboldt Bay Harbor Recreation Conservation District is a special district of the state of California established in the 1970s to oversee the development, recreation, conservation, and other activities within the tidally influenced waters of Humboldt Bay. The state of California's jurisdiction goes three miles offshore of the, the beach effectively. Beyond that is federal waters. And in our communications with multiple tribal entities uh, over the past couple of years, several tribes consider federal waters off of the coast or the waters off of the coast to be unceded tribal territory. Uh, and the Harbor District um, honors the, that uh, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to call this federal waters because the federal government has leased this area shown in green for the purposes of developing offshore wind farms. That is known as the Humboldt Offshore Wind Lease Area. The plan is for wind turbines to be installed throughout that multi hundred square mile area to produce electricity to be distributed uh, throughout Northern California. That wind farm at its closest, that lease area anyway, uh, is at least 20 miles from the shoreline at its closest point. So it is effectively 17 miles outside of the jurisdiction of the state of California and far outside of the authority of control or jurisdiction of the Humboldt Bay Harbor District. So while what I'm sharing with you today about the project being conducted by the Harbor District does have a relationship with the offshore wind farm off the coast, the Harbor District is not directly involved in that wind farm project. Instead, what we're involved with is the import assembly of offshore wind turbines. We are effectively creating a manufacturing plant where wind turbines will be made, and then they will be towed out to that lease area. So our project is here in Humboldt Bay. Uh, you'll see this map in a moment. I'll go into much more detail, but generally that map to scale on top of Humboldt Bay is right here. And that is the site where the Harbor District's project will be manufacturing wind turbines. And zooming back out, there's not just one wind farm uh, or lease area, but there are uh, others uh, in California. So down off the coast of Morro Bay, there is another lease area which has been broken into three sub areas. The Humboldt one broken into two sub areas. 
but between these two larger areas, uh, planned wind farms in both locations. So what we have is uh, the Humboldt lease area and a project in Humboldt Bay to manufacture wind turbines. And then uh, the turbines that we manufacture will very likely, some of them end up at the Humboldt lease area. But there's also a very good chance that turbines we manufacture in Humboldt Bay can also be towed down to the Morro Bay lease area. And there are future lease areas planned in Oregon and other parts of California that the turbines manufactured in Humboldt Bay could ultimately end up in as well. So the way we phrase this is the Humboldt offshore wind lease area will likely be a customer of the import assembly of offshore wind turbines in Humboldt Bay, but not the only customer. The project in Humboldt Bay will supply wind turbines to multiple wind farms. Okay, <clears throat> before we get into the Humboldt Bay project and the manufacturing of wind turbines, I want to give us the, a bit of background, and it's important for that first context to be relevant to this conversation. The Harbor District's not doing a project out in the ocean, and so when I talk about that, it's really just to provide context so you can understand what our project is all about. This is a uh, coal-fired power plant. It burns fossil fuels 24-7, 365 to produce electricity. Not a lot of these around where we live in uh, Northern California, but we do have natural gas power plants, which burns a different kind of fossil fuel to generate electricity. This is an offshore wind power plant. It captures the kinetic energy. Each one of these turbines captures, captures the kinetic energy of wind and converts it into electricity without burning any fossil fuels, no effective uh, carbon footprint of the production of energy through this uh, method of uh, energy production. Each one of these turbines, if I'm oversimplifying here, transmits electricity through cables that all then comes on shore and powers our homes and businesses. So why offshore wind and how does that fit into our overall renewable energy goals as a nation? Well, generally, the federal government has established a goal of having 30 gigawatts of offshore wind produced in our nation by the year 2030, or within the next six years. 30 gigawatts is a lot of power. It is the equivalent of what 60 average American coal-fired power plants produce. So that is a really remarkable uh, amount of renewable energy the federal government is seeking to establish, which could decommission ultimately our need for uh, carbon-based power. State of California also has renewable energy goals, including offshore wind. The state is seeking to have 100% clean electricity in the state of California by the year 2045. And around the year 2020, we're about 60% of the way there. Uh, though we are decommissioning ultimately hydro and nuclear power throughout the state. So we have some catching up to do. And every year we consume more electricity than we did the year before. And so the demand for electricity uh, in that last 40% is a lot of work to do and a lot of catching up to do to get to 100% renewable energy. So to get to that goal, the state has come up with a pretty sophisticated plan with a whole portfolio of different types of energy uh, renewable energy to get to that goal. We can cut out the bottom part of the table here with hydro and nuclear because that's not part of California's plan. And so the plan consists mostly of solar battery storage and wind. If we look at offshore wind, um, why? Why are we looking at wind energy at all? Why not just use solar for the state of California? There's a lot of reasons. Uh, one of which is the sun doesn't shine at night. Um, but even with that, solar is still a predominant part of the plan. And there are really two main categories here. You've got utility scale solar, which are big solar farms and customer scale solar, which is solar panels in people's homes. And uh, a lot of people ask, why not just put all of our energy into putting solar panels on everyone's homes throughout the state? From what I understand, that wouldn't produce enough electricity for all of our, our needs. Then there's battery storage and onshore and offshore wind. And the state recently changed its goals for offshore wind to have five gigawatts by 2030 and 25 gigawatts by 2045. 
but you can see onshore wind is also a big part of the plan. And if we compare these types of energy to one another, solar is close to 100 gigawatts, whereas wind is just under 40 gigawatts. Even battery storage has a larger capacity than the, the plans for offshore wind. So offshore wind is part of the picture, but according to the state's analysis, a necessary part of the picture if we're going to get to 100% renewable energy. So long story short, if we're going to replace fossil fuel based power, we need solar battery storage and wind both onshore and offshore to get to that goal. So how are we doing so far in this energy transition? Are we on track to meet our goals? In 2009, globally, 80% of all energy produced came from burning fossil fuels. 10 years later, it was effectively the same percentage, but the amount of energy we consume globally has increased by quite a lot. So renewable energy has increased over that time, but because we increased the amount of energy we consume, we are now burning more fossil fuel than we did 10 years ago. Currently, the world's burning more fossil fuels than it ever has before. And in the United States, renewable energy is having some challenges. So according to this article from USA Today released in February of 2024, in the past decade, about 180 US counties got their first commercial wind power projects. But in that same period, more than twice as many US counties blocked wind development, which means that two thirds of wind projects, renewable energy production wind projects in the US have been blocked at the local level. And it's not quite as bad for solar, uh, but it's about 50 50. So what that means is that some of the areas with the best sources of wind and solar power have been what this article says is boxed out. At least 15% of counties in the US have halted new utility scale wind, solar, or both. And that might not sound like a lot, but it is really significant because wind and solar companies are trying to put their first projects in the places where wind and solar is the best place to put those kinds of renewable energy projects, a place that can produce the most amount of renewable energy in the most efficient way. So it's the most highly productive areas to develop wind and solar that are being blocked. So the article comes to the conclusion that our overall national climate change goals are going to be difficult to achieve if the answer is no in the county and county after county, really at the local level. So the article implies that one of the reasons we are still burning fossil fuels to produce energy is because local communities do not want renewable energy projects in their neighborhoods. There's this expectation that someone else is going to solve the climate change problem somewhere else. So that's a kind of a bleak status report of our transition to renewable energy. Uh, it is largely being blocked at the local level. Um, two thirds of wind projects and half solar projects. Another question that I get uh, frequently when I do these presentations is why are offshore wind turbines so big? If we need wind turbines to produce renewable energy, why are they so large? Well, here's a bit of a history on that. So in 1990, Denmark installed the first offshore wind turbine. It was about 200 feet tall. Uh, a little bit smaller than the Statue of Liberty. And then the nation of Sweden installed uh, wind turbines in the ocean. And they were a little bit bigger because bigger was more efficient, produced more energy. Uh, then United Kingdom, and then a number of other countries came online throughout Europe, eventually China uh, being the ninth nation to install offshore wind. And as each country got involved, wind turbines got larger and larger and larger over the past 25 years, to the point where just recently the largest wind turbine in the world was 13 megawatts, until just a few days ago when China installed uh, and is now testing a 16 megawatt turbine. 
So looking at this trajectory, as we plan for California's offshore wind industry and the production of renewable energy, we are looking to the next generation, 15 to 25 megawatt turbines. So it doesn't really answer the question though, when it comes to wind turbines, why is bigger better? And I like to use an analogy to kind of explore this question. If you consider the transport of cargo, say we have an organic lettuce farm and we're gonna grow lettuce and then transport it to our customers throughout the region. We can either transport our lettuce in a semi vehicle, semi truck, or we can load up a bunch of sedans with lettuce. They can both carry cargo, but one semi truck has the same carrying capacity, same transport volume as 206 uh, sedans. But 206 sedans requires 224 metric tons of steel to manufacture, while one semi truck requires eight metric tons of steel. So 206 average sedans requires 28 times more steel to produce than one semi truck to transport the same amount of cargo. One semi truck also would use far less fuel to transport that material. So it's just more efficient to have a larger vehicle. It's more efficient in the material inputs, the energy to produce it, the number of operators and a lot of other factors. That analogy can apply to wind turbines. If you wanna increase the amount of energy you produce, and decrease the amount of energy needed to make the product, you can increase the wind turbine. It also decreases the ongoing maintenance requirements. So think about maintaining 206 sedans rather than maintaining one semi truck and just the environmental impact of maintaining those two would be starkly different. So increasing the energy production by getting larger turbines reduces your maintenance costs, reduces your material inputs, reduces the cost of energy and decreases your environmental impact. And to drive this point home uh, and kind of look at wind turbines, uh, in this case, we've got a wind turbine that is 50 feet tall or 15 meters tall. And according to this, uh, this table that I found at 15 meters, it can, produce enough of energy for five homes. But if we double the size of that turbine, now it's 30 meters tall, but because of the efficiency of increasing that swept area, the circle, so the circle gets far more than twice as large when you go in double in height, now we can power 50 homes. If we double the height, you get 10 times the amount of power output. Double it again, now we have 10 times the power output again. And if we get to this one all the way on the right here, we're now talking about an 80 meter tall turbine, two and a half megawatts. That is five times the height of the one on the far left, but has 273 times the number of homes that can be powered. Uh, and it really comes down to that circle of the blades as they spin around. Well, and there's a lot of other factors like the height. It can reach um, more wind speeds up higher. And that two and a half megawatt turbine uh, is here on this scale of the size of wind turbines uh, that are uh, in the water in the world today and those that we're planning for the future. So long story short, one 25 megawatt turbine produces much more power than 10 two and a half megawatt turbines, but uses far less materials to produce than 10 of those units. So, doesn't still really answer the question of the physics. How is bigger so much better? I'm not going to get into that. There's a great YouTube video, um, uh, the physics of windmill design that gets into the specifics of how bigger turbines produce so much more energy. I encourage you to watch that. It's from One Minute Physics on YouTube. How are offshore wind turbines made? Well, on the left, we're thinking about size again. Onshore wind turbines out in the desert or up on the land at their largest are about half the size of offshore wind turbines that we're planning for. The reason is because of transportation. So in this case, this train is transporting wind turbine blades, but if they get too long, you can't take the train around corners. The blades would hang over the edge uh, and cause problems. And so you have to transport each blade by truck but even that has its upper limits. But 
offshore wind turbines, all of the equipment can be moved around by ship, so you can move much larger components. The price you have to pay for that is that you have to manufacture the wind turbines and all of their primary parts in a port so that they can the parts can be lifted onto ships. You can't manufacture them inland and then transport them to the coast and then put them on ships you couldn't get from the plant to the coast. They have to be manufactured right next to the water. This has been done in Europe for a couple of decades now, um, all over Western Europe. Now that the East Coast of the United States is doing the same thing with multiple projects uh, on the uh, Atlantic coast. So what needs to be done to make offshore wind reality? Well, you have to have these import manufacturing assembly of equipment, Humboldt Bay being the first on the West Coast, uh, the Port of Long Beach also um, right there with us, uh, planning a very similar project. Other ports, as I'll explain in a moment, will have important roles. There is also the operation of power plants out in the ocean. Once those turbines are manufactured and towed out to the ocean connected, then there are companies that maintain and operate those. That's another separate category of projects. There is also then transmission, and we're going to need to reconfigure our transmission system to move the power from where it's produced to where it is consumed. As a port authority, we are really only involved in project type number one. So there are a lot of other great resources about these other projects. I'm gonna focus really only on what's happening in ports and bays. And so in port manufacturing assembly of equipment, we'll kind of fall into three primary categories, the making of the components, putting them together, and then operating, really hosting the ships that operate and maintain wind farms. So if we look at these one at a time, somebody's got to make these steel towers. Somebody's got to make these blades. Somebody's got to make the, the nacelles of the turbine generator. All of that manufacturing has to happen in ports next to the water. And wherever these are manufactured, say it's San Diego, San Francisco, Port of Wainimi, other ports in California, ports throughout the West Coast, wherever they're manufactured, each one of those parts has to find themselves on a ship, and then all of those ships have to end up in one location so it can all be put together. This is what the Port of Humboldt is gonna specialize in. So we will likely receive the parts to make the floating foundation, which is a large barge the turbine goes on top of. So that's what you see here, this large yellow structure is a floating foundation. Uh, and this circle here is where the, the wind turbine tower gets connected and then it is built up from there. So what you're seeing here is a floating foundation that was assembled on land. It's being moved across the ground onto the semi-submersible barge, which will then sink beneath it. Then this yellow floating foundation will be floating in the water and it will be brought over to a crane that's just outside of this photo where the wind turbine will be built on top of it as the floating foundation is floating in the water with the crane and all the equipment lifting from the land as it's built in the water. That is staging integration. So in this photo here, you can see the yellow floating foundation is in the water. It was manufactured likely up on land and then launched into the water. And now this crane is putting the tower sections on top. Once the tower sections are all on, then you connect the nacelle or the, the central hub uh, that generates the power. And then one at a time, you connect each of the three blades, two of which are connected here. And you can see the third blade being connected. Once it is fully assembled, floating in the bay, then it's connected to large vessels, tugboats, anchor handling vessels, and towed out to sea. I showed this image earlier. You can see the size of turbines as they are being towed. They are very large, towed vertically like this. And in the background of this image, you have the Golden Gate Bridge. And so you can see that one of these vertical toes could not get past the Golden Gate Bridge. This is the problem you would run into if you did the vertical assembly in the Bay of San Francisco. You couldn't get past um, the bridge, so you'd be stuck in the bay. San Francisco can manufacture blades or towers or a lot of other components, uh, but vertical assembly is not on the table for the, the Port of San Francisco or other ports in the Bay. But Humboldt County, uh, Humboldt Bay, Long Beach, uh, other ports on the West Coast are actively working on developing these staging and integration projects. 
Once the turbines are manufactured and towed out to sea and connected, then you need the third type of port, which is to service the vessels that mm, operate and maintain the wind turbines. So these vessels, um, some of them which will be such as a crew transfer vessel, will pull into port, pull up to a dock. A crew of specialists will get on board of the vessel and go out to sea for one or two weeks and go from turbine to turbine conducting maintenance. Those specialists will, some of them will specialize in the floating foundations and maintaining those components. Some will specialize in the nacelles or the blades. Um, there may be drone pilots. Some of this infrastructure is underwater, so there will likely be divers and possible uh, uh, operators of remote control subs to do inspections. So port type number three are those ports that host the vessels that do operation and maintenance out at sea. And so those are likely to be the ones that are closest to the wind farms that can that host those vessels. So which ports are gonna be involved in this? All of them. Uh, all ports are likely to play some role. A lot of things need to be manufactured. Staging integration needs to occur and the hosting of operation and maintenance ships. Humboldt Bay is going to specialize in staging and integration. So let's look at that Humboldt Bay project now that you have the context. So we zoom in on this. There is the lease area off the coast relative to the uh, Humboldt Bay. If we zoom in on the Humboldt Bay, just for context, you've got the city of Eureka right there in the center, city of Arcata and Cal Poly Humboldt just at the top of the map here in the north part of the bay. College of the Redwoods down here on the south part of the bay, and the Weat Tribe Reservation down here on the south part of the bay. All of this territory, all of this area shown in this map is Weat ancestral territory, uh, and uh, the Weat Tribe uh, and several other tribes with Weat heritage um, are active participants in evaluating this project. If we turn this map to the north and to the right, and overlay it with this map here. This is looking at the federal navigation channels and the uh, industrial lands of Humboldt Bay. So this teal area here is the federal navigation channel uh, established and maintained by the US Army Corps of Engineers. You can think of it as a highway in the bay. Uh, the Corps maintains that at a certain depth and certain width uh, for ship traffic. The purple areas, are the industrial lands of uh, Humboldt Bay, coastal dependent industrial lands, the vast majority of which was formerly uh, involved in timber production, export, lumber, uh, wood products, manufacturing. Um, that industry fell on hard times a couple of decades ago, and now much of this land is either heavily underutilized or vacant and uh, has the opportunity for revitalization. This green area is among those purple, and that is our project site. This is an older version of a concept map at the project site, uh, and I'll go into that in a moment. But let's just look at the history of this site for a moment. So for three consecutive generations, it was the largest employment center in the region. Uh, paper mill, wood product manufacturing. 2008 era, um, it was shuttered, massive layoffs, and uh, I'll show you in a moment what it looks like today. At its peak in the 1950s, this is what it looked like. So there was a lot of activity here, a lot of people working at this site, a lot of products manufactured and produced and exported out of this location. There is and was a seven acre redwood dock right here. If you keep your eye on that spot, this is what the site looks like today. So this is generally the project boundaries. We are kind of in the middle of the site looking uh, south. And uh, a lot of site cleanup has occurred, as you can tell, and there's more to come. So that's a benefit of this project is the cleanup of the site and really the revitalization of this to be a modern, high-tech, modern manufacturing center of renewable energy uh, equipment. So this is a version of uh, what the project um, could look like. The dappled pattern here is lay down area. So the vast majority of the site is open lay down area with compacted gravel. 
um, where blades, uh, tower sections, nacelles, anchors, other components of offshore wind turbines would uh, be shipped in from other ports. Cranes, like this crawler crane here, this big yellow one, would pick them up off the ship and then move them around on the site and stack them up so that uh, the site is prepared to assemble the wind turbines. We are also building into the permitting for the project up to 600,000 square feet to manufacture uh, components such as blades uh, at the project site. Uh, though, at least at first, we're primarily going to focus exclusively on staging integration and build in the capacity and the opportunity to do advanced manufacturing in the future. The site will also include the assembly of floating foundations. I'll show you another version of this map shortly where the floating foundation assembly is on the opposite side, but generally um, we would receive large components of the floating foundations and put them all together and then launch them into the water. So in this case, you can see the components kind of coming together here. And then once it's fully assembled, it is launched into the water using that semi-submersible barge I explained earlier. And then you've got the floating foundation in the water. From there, you can do one of two things with it. You can either put it into wet storage, which is kind of a parking lot for the equipment as it's waiting for its turn at the, at the crane, at the wharf, or if the crane and wharf are ready, then you can bring it over uh, and begin the vertical assembly process. And so that's where you have the crane next to the, uh, the, the floating foundation and you build the components up on top of it one at a time. Once it's fully assembled, then two things can happen from there. Either you can tow it out to sea, or you can tow it into wet storage while it's waiting for its turn to go out uh, into uh, the, the wind uh, areas out in the ocean. And then we have another wharf uh, and crane on the other side of the project, so there's a whole another vertical assembly occurring. I do want to point out that wet storage is something that we are still sorting out how much we need exactly where the areas are. Um, so the simulations I'm going to be showing shortly don't include wet storage as we sort out um, what that's going to look like. So again, you've got another wharf over here uh, that's conducting vertical assembly. It takes about a week to go from the beginning of assembly to completion for it to be towed out. So launching that floating foundation and putting all the tower sections and the nacelle and the blades on top takes about a week. And that's relevant as I'll explain in a moment. Once it's ready to go, then it is towed from here out the federal navigation channel. And from there can go to multiple possible locations, could go to the Morro Bay lease area, could go to future Oregon lease areas, could go to the Humboldt lease area or other future lease areas. At the end of the bay is really the end of the project from the, Har the Humboldt Bay Harbor District, and that begins the, the journey uh, of another project that really has purchased the wind turbines and is going through the process of installing. So to the point of this presentation, what will this site look like? Well, I want to point out that the wet storage is not shown in these simulations as we sort out is this the right amount of wet storage? Is this too much? Is this the right location for wet storage? What you will see in the simulations are turbines being assembled at the wharf and the cranes, and then the laydown areas and uh, the buildings. A couple of uh, considerations about visual simulations in CEQA. This is generally the size of the largest turbines in the ocean in the world right now, or on land. And as I said, this is what we're planning for for the future size of turbines. So should we simulate future speculative size turbines or should we simulate what currently exists? And we decided to simulate the larger of those because it is, it is the more significant potential impact over the lifetime of this project of manufacturing wind turbines in Humboldt Bay. We anticipate that we will be manufacturing larger turbines than those are currently in the the ocean today. So these are the dimensions of uh, the turbines we uh, are planning to manufacture. And this is the most important dimension here from the, our project's perspective is the width or the beam of the floating foundations. This is effectively the largest 
that wharf one of our projects could build. Though there are other restrictions early in the project timeline that will likely limit the floating foundations to something smaller. So the simulations you see likely overestimate the size of the turbines that will manufacture at least for some period of time of the project's uh, lifetime. But because this is the more significant potential impact, this is what we are uh, simulating. And we may do simulations in the future that reduce the size of the turbines as we conduct additional research. One last thing before I show the simulations, project phasing. You're gonna see simulations at various phases of the project. So I have showed this map, but uh, this is what will be constructed first, the north half of the project. And this is what we've recently received pretty large grants to construct. Future phases of the project will come later, and so you'll see those as a separate simulation. So you effectively have uh, the north half of the project, which will come online first. It will have uh, a large crane and lay down area and potentially wet storage, though we're not simulating that at the moment. And then eventually the rest of the project will be constructed with another crane, more lay down area and potentially more wet storage. So you have a first phase of development and a second phase of development. We take that 2D map, lay it down, and turn it into a 3D model. This is what phase one would look like. So you can see a large ring crane. Uh, it's a large crane that pivots in place, the lay down area. And here you've got a unit that is right up against the wharf, and it is being tested before it can be towed out. So when you see this simulation, you will see um, units being constructed at the crane and a fully assembled unit at uh, the testing wharf. And then future simulations may show wet storage, but that's not modeled yet. Simulation also includes one of the units being towed out. So this is outside of the project area, down the channel, uh, as this unit is being towed out of the bay. This is full build out, so that takes everything when this doesn't, that model doesn't include uh, wet storage. So that takes everything that was already there and then adds a, another ring crane and uh, the assembly of floating foundations, uh, but it also includes this unit being towed out. All right, you'll see simulations from six locations. I could go into great detail about how we selected those six locations. We analyzed 137 candidates, including a number of locations in Trinidad, McKinleyville, Arcata, uh, throughout Eureka and South Bay. Uh, we narrowed it down to six locations that are good representatives of um, Canada, good representatives of the other sites. So uh, these six locations have various view orientations, south, west, north, east facing, and various uh, distances, foreground, midground, background. All right, so let's look at these. The Eureka Boardwalk is the first one that I'll show you. It's right here. This is the photo uh, that you're gonna see a simulation on top of. This is west facing, and it is uh, about 0.6 miles away. Before the show, it's simulations. Uh, I'm not gonna read all of this, but there are limitations to photo simulations. This is an approximation, uh, and so, um, standard to make sure that the audience understands those. I encourage you to pause this if you'd like to read that. Also realize that the viewing distance that you're looking at the screen and the size of your screen also matters. So I encourage you to pause this and you can use chat GPT or the internet to help you figure out how far to stand away from your screen in order to have a photo realistic understanding of what you're looking at. Okay, so Eureka Boardwalk, west facing 0.6 miles away. We are right here on the Eureka Boardwalk, Bayfront One restaurant, living the dream ice cream. You're standing right here looking northwest. This is the existing conditions or before. In each one of these simulations, I'm going to show you where the smokestack is because it is a good uh, indicator of the likelihood that you will see the project. If wherever you are, you cannot see that smokestack, a very good chance you would not be able to see this project. If you can see the smokestack, you're likely to be able to see the project. So in each image, I'm going to show you that, where that is. 
this is phase one with the crane. So as I explained, this crane uh, and uh, it has launched the floating foundation in the water and it is now building up the tower section bit by bit that takes a week. So there are going to be times throughout the lifetime of the project where the project looks just like this uh, is a crane building the turbine, but for days out of each week, you won't be able to see the units yet because uh, they're still being assembled. Then at some point in the week, oh, sorry. So um, if we look at this model again, there is that crane. This is a ring crane, kind of looks like this. And it is assembling the, uh, the, the floating foundation units. So here is a unit that is partially assembled. It's got the tower section on, the nacelle on top, and two blades, and it is lifting the third blade on to the unit. So that is that one from this model. Putting on the blade. This is another unit that is fully assembled. It is at the testing wharf, and uh, it is being commissioned before it can be towed out. It may be relatively rare that you would have this view where there is both a unit being assembled and it's nearly complete and a unit in testing, but it is a possibility, so we simulated that. And if we add to this, uh, that's just, this is what this would look like. So this unit is against the wharf. So once it's done here, it goes over to there. This is the unit being towed out. So if you see right here, there's a large ship. And that is connected to the unit as well as a couple of other tugs um, that are towing the unit out. And from our model, that is right here. What's not shown in this is the wet storage. So phase one wet storage uh, is currently uh, envisioned over here. And so in this image, there could be another unit or two uh, shown right here in this location. The other wet storage is for full build out. Speaking of full build out, what I'm just simulating here, what you're seeing here is phase one. If we add full build out to it, then this is what you would see. So there is an additional crane with an additional unit being manufactured. So everything in the image that you already saw was there, plus we added this crane and a unit being assembled. There is a crawler crane, so that's a large crane that is on tank treads that moves around, moves the equipment, brings it to the other cranes. And then the floating foundation assembly, you can see multiple floating foundations, this time on the south side of the project. So all of that again, uh, I won't do this for each simulation, but just that was context so you can see how the model works. So this is phase one with just the crane. With a unit nearing completion. Another unit that is complete and is being tested. Another unit being towed out. And you can see the ship right there that's towing it. This is probably a relatively unusual scenario of what you would see in phase one. Um, not a typical day, but certainly a possibility. And then full build out. Future simulations uh, may include wet storage. Arcata Marsh and Wildlife Sanctuary is the next site. This is southwest facing, just under five miles away. We are right here. So if you go past that Jeep, walk up to the water, you'd be standing right there looking southwest. This is before, there's the smokestack. This is phase one with just the crane. With a unit under construction, another unit, uh, the unit under construction, and another unit at the wharf under inspection, unit being towed out, and then full build out. So, all of that again without anything else on the screen. Manila Park is the third location. This is the photo that will be simulated. It's south facing and two and a quarter miles away. 
site is right here on the Samoa Peninsula, in the northern part of the Samoa Peninsula. If you're in the middle of this park, you would not be able to see the project under any scenario because of trees and houses and topography uh, blocking the view. And that's the case for the majority of the Samoa Peninsula, really the majority of the area. Um, in order to see the project, you would have to go up to the water and get it an open view. So at this site, Manila Park, you have to walk through these trees and walk right up to the edge of the water to be able to have this view right here. There is the smokestack just poking above the trees. This is just the crane, a unit under construction, another unit under inspection. So here we are lined up with the shoreline of that site, so um, it's not a big difference. There's a unit being towed out, and here is full, uh, full build out. USS Milwaukee on the Samoa Peninsula, right across the street from the project site. 0 0.06 miles away, it's effectively right next door. It's just across the street. If you go onto the Samoa Peninsula and go to this location right here, you can see the smokestack on your left. There's a big rock on your right. That is a memorial to the USS Milwaukee that grounded here a couple of generations ago. If you turn your back to that rock, this is what you would see. These power lines are in the foreground. They're just above the road here. So you will see wind turbines behind those, but they don't interfere with each other. Um, the lines are far closer to us. The smokestack uh, is just outside of this image, so it is off to the right. This is phase one with just the crane. Unit being built near completion. You can see the uh, uh, last blade being lifted on. Unit under inspection and full build out. Fort Humboldt State Park. The site has a commanding view of the Bayshore Mall. The site is behind it, two miles away. We're facing north. So the site is right there. And this is another one of those sites where you really have to be right up on the edge of the project, or right of the area to see the project. So we're looking in that direction. There is the smokestack. Here is just the crane in phase one. Unit under construction. Unit under inspection, third unit being towed out, and full build out. Table Bluff County Park, last one. This is the photo that's simulated. We're facing north, and this is eight and a half miles away. Site is right there. If we go uh, to the end of uh, Table Bluff Road, Look in that direction, go past that sign, go up to this uh, pull out and look right there and you would see the project site. We had to go back to this site three times to get a photo that would work uh, because of the fog. So there's at least some portion of the year where this site and others at a particular distance where you wouldn't be able to see the project it really takes a sunny day. So this is the photo, um, third attempt, uh, and you can see the smokestack right there, relatively small. This is just the crane of phase one, a unit under construction, second unit under inspection, third unit being towed out and full build out. So as I said, uh, a sunny day is needed to see the site from a particular distance uh, and this at eight and a half miles away took us a couple of attempts to get a photo that would work. One last consideration uh, about visual simulations. Buildings, trees, and topography block the views of even the largest structures. So, for instance, this is a big building with a beautiful mural on it. But if you take 10 steps to the right, you can't see that mural anymore. And take 100 steps further to the right, and there's no chance you can see that mural. The same is true of the wind turbines. At this specific location, at the intersection of F and 5th Streets in Eureka, if it weren't for all the buildings and trees, you'd be able to see the project. But because of the buildings and trees, there's no way you'll be able to see the project even if you really back up. Um, so throughout the majority of Eureka Arcata throughout the region, you want to be able to see the project. Good rule of thumb is if you can't see the smokestack, you're not going to be able to see the project. Okay. So coming to a conclusion here, um, 
I'm sure a lot of people are curious about simulation of the turbines when they're in the ocean, and um, I encourage you to, to look into that uh, and to communicate with, there's a lot of parties that I, I'm sure have good information on that. The Harbor District's not involved in the wind farms out in the ocean. Uh, that is in federal waters. It's outside of the jurisdiction of California. It's certainly outside of the jurisdiction of the Harbor District. Uh, we're manufacturing turbines in the bay that is 20 miles offshore. You saw what the, the turbines look like at eight and a half miles. Um, I encourage you to talk to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the companies RWE and Vineyard, if you want to know more about the offshore wind farm off the coast. Quick summary here, we've got import assembly of offshore wind turbines further down the peninsula there. Once they're done, they're towed out of the entrance to the end of our project. And from there, they'll end up in either Morro Bay, Oregon, Humboldt lease area, or other wind farms on the west coast of the US. All right, quick status report. We have signed a project labor agreement. There's a lot of great detail about that that I don't have time to share. Um, tribal engagement. Um, we're working with a number of different tribes uh, on a lot of different topics related to this project, uh, and we will continue to do so for the next couple of years. We have a community engagement strategy that our board has adopted. It's actually community uh, commitments and engagement strategy. Uh, workforce strategy, working with the County of Humboldt, Economic Development Department, Cal Poly Humboldt, College of the Redwoods, a number of other parties, a lot of union uh, participation in developing a strategy for how we can produce a local workforce for the construction operations of this site and other similar projects. CEQA, NEPA permits, 30% design for the terminal project in Humboldt Bay are well underway. We're planning on this being a green terminal, shooting for net zero um, carbon emissions from the project as early in the timeline as we feasibly can. Community benefit program, I could go into a lot of detail about that. We have a lot of grants totaling over $450 million. Just looking at that last one, $426 million. Uh, most of it is for construction of the project though it also includes $51 million for environmental restoration, a million dollars for a trail in Small Peninsula to benefit the community there, $2.3 million for an eco shoreline, $10 million for an on-site solar array to produce renewable energy for the project, $1.2 million for public recreation access, like a fishing pier, kayak launch, um, $3 million for a dredge dewatering area, which should benefit other projects throughout the bay, $6 million for a community benefit program targeting tribes, fishermen, and nearby residents. $2 million for fishermen storage relocation to Woodley Island. And $1 million for relocation of existing aquaculture tenants, totaling to more than $77.5 million outside of the project footprint to benefit Humboldt Bay and our community. Looking at the schedule, really quick summary. Uh, permits, we uh, plan on bringing the CEQA draft environmental impact report to our board in March of 2025. Mitigation construction could begin in late 2025. The project could itself begin construction in late 2026. And at the very end of 2029, beginning of 2030, we'll be ready for operations. There's a YouTube channel with now two videos on it with more to come. I promised shorter videos uh, and some of those are coming soon. I encourage you to check out HumboldtBay.org, and there's a specific web page on that website um, that goes into detail about this project. And there are several up and coming opportunities for public engagement, input, and feedback. I encourage everyone to get involved. Uh, it's really not the Harvard District's job to try to convince people to love this project, but it is our job to help you understand what's being proposed. And so we welcome questions, we welcome participation. I encourage you to get involved. And if you want to know more, uh, if you want to participate, please reach out to us directly. And with that, uh, I say thank you, and I will end this uh, nearly hour-long video and promise for some shorter ones to come uh, soon. Thank you.